Perfect. All right. Fall lawn care for cool season lawns. Let's go ahead and get started. So brief introductions. My name is Will. I'm one of the yard advisors here at Sunday. I got my bachelor's of science in environmental and sustainability sciences from Cornell University uh, and worked on a vegetable farm in the summers uh, between high school and then uh, coming home from college before starting here at Sunday. So be chatting a bit more about uh, pest pressure, lawn preparation, general overview for the webinar here today. And then Ivana is our weed expert and repair expert. So even though she's tuning in from uh, down in Texas, she's still a, a very knowledgeable yard advisor. We will still let her talk about cool season lawns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, guys, I'm uh, from, you know, Austin, Texas. I got my bachelor's of science from Texas State University in horticulture. Um, I've worked in landscaping, both growing and maintaining plants, um, anything from trees, shrubs, perennials, grasses. So just here to talk about plants, the best subject there is. All right. So before we get started, I do want to take a step back and essentially consider where we're at in the season and how this ties into uh, the Sunday plan or the, the Sunday way, if you will. Um, so if you have attended any webinars earlier this year, this chart may look extremely familiar. <laughs> uh, this was present in the order of operations webinar. If you're unable to attend that webinar, I highly recommend uh, viewing it for next spring. It's a, a very similar information to today, but a bigger focus on the spring and heading into the summer months, whereas today is more so focused on heading into the fall and then uh, the winter time. Slightly tweaked today due to the time of year, but still same general uh, thought process. So the first step I'd like to highlight is lawn preparation, right? So this is where we're going to chat about considering that the lawn is essentially a dynamic system, right? And this tends to be one of the uh, largest or, or uh, most significant differences between the Sunday plan or the Sunday way and your conventional uh, lawn care programs, right? We really want to consider the environment which we're working with. And so if we're able to consider, you know, there's this area of um, the lawn, which I'm looking to repair this fall, right? We could throw some grass seed down and not necessarily take as comprehensive of, of um, an approach. And we'll probably be seeing the same patch develop in future seasons as well, right? But if we take a step back and consider, okay, why am I working with, or why is there the need to uh, repair this area? If there um, was a weed there, right? Why was that weed able to take hold? Could there be an underlying soil factor inhibiting the grass from establishing in this area? Uh, could I have a potential um, turf grass pest, right? Is, are there any actions I need to take there to discourage these pests from taking hold? Uh, if, from a repair perspective, do I need to repair the area uh, or just throw some grass seed down? Or do I want to add a bit of topsoil, for example? So if we're able to ask those questions prior to moving forward, we're going to be setting the lawn up for long-term success. From there, we'll dive into weed control. So essentially identifying uh, which weeds are present, how uh, to remove them and uh, essentially proceed from there. Thirdly, we'll chat about turf grass pests. So how to determine if a pest is present, how that damage differs from um, patches uh, created from uh, weeds being present or, or other factors. Fourthly, we'll explain how to actually patch and repair these areas. And then lastly, we'll discuss what to start to plan for um, prior to the winter, right? So when to start uh, ending the watering schedule, mowing height, uh, when to uh, factor in that final fertilizer application. So all great questions to, to ask before <laughs> the winter months actually get here. And lastly, the final note on the slide, always consider the environmental conditions before uh, moving forward, right? And so this will be especially uh, crucial to consider during the winterized slide, right? When we're chatting about a uh, fertilizer application, just making sure that we're cognizant of essentially what the environment's like. I realized last year, um, depending on where you're at in the country, it could have been a very early fall, could have been a very late fall, right? I know uh, here south of Buffalo, we had much warmer days heading into November than uh, was typical. So um, considering that this year might lead to slightly different application dates and always good to, to keep that in mind. Yeah, so we're gonna get started with lawn preparation, just kind of getting everything ready, taking stock of the environment. Um, so this is something that I would do first, you know, start from the ground up, take stock of your soil, see what all needs to be done. 
Um, and these are all practices that you're going to want to do um, when it's 60 to 75 degrees um, for several weeks, several weeks afterward. Um, and that's just to make sure that your grass is still actively growing and getting a benefit from these practices. Um, so one of the things that people ask a lot about, I know we had some few questions in the registration um, questions uh, box is dethatching your lawn. So dethatching is something that can either be very beneficial or detrimental depending just on how much thatch you actually have. Um, you want about an inch of thatch on your grass and that just serves as a nice protective layer. You know, it keeps the soil from drying out. Um, it keeps, you know, the soil from eroding, that kind of thing. Um, anything more than that, and that's when you're going to want to consider dethatching. Um, and that's something that I would do out of all of these practices. That's what I would do first. So if you're making a list, you know, a checklist for everything you got to get done, dethatching would be the first one for me there. Um, after that, we would go into aerating. And this is, again, something that either is detrimental or beneficial. Um, and this is something that I would really only recommend for soils that are heavy clay um, or that are compacted. So aerating is um, pulling up plugs, as you can see in that image um, of the soil, pulling them out of that area. And that's to increase, you know, airflow to the roots. They do need oxygen, um, increase, you know, watering. Sometimes if the soil is very compacted, you won't be able to actually get that water penetration. Um, so it's just there to break up the soil and make it easier for things um, to modify that environment. Um, you don't really need to aerate if your soil is not compacted or if you've got a very sandy soil. Um, that would just, you know, kind of break up the soil texture. We do just want to keep it intact a little bit. Um, so, you know, if you don't need to aerate, I would recommend holding off on doing so. Uh, you can test this with what we call the screwdriver test. Um, we'll have an article with more information on that. But basically, just pushing a screwdriver into your soil, seeing if you met or met with resistance. Resistance equals aerating. No resistance equals holding off this season. Um, and I see Mary had a question on what is thatching? So um, dethatching is just removing the kind of dead-ish grass um, that kind of builds up over time. So if you've fertilized very heavily in the past, um, or if you had an event where a lot of your grass blades died off, not your actual grass, but some of the blades, you'll start to get a buildup of these kind of yellowish, um, brownish leaves in between your grasses. It's gonna kind of look like a mat underneath your grass. Um, so if you have about an inch of it, that's totally fine. That's healthy. Um, anything more than that. And that's when you would rent, you know, a dethatching tool um, to dethatch that area. And then as far as aerating goes, I just want to note that core aeration is going to be the best one for your lawn, the healthiest one. Um, anything, you know, if you see those spike shoes or anything that um, just kind of pushes into the soil, but doesn't pull anything out, all that's going to do is compact the area around those holes. And it might actually end up making it worse in the long run. So if you are going to aerate the season, I would highly recommend a core aerator, um, and that can be done after dethatching, um, but before moving on to these next soil amendments. And Ivana, before we dive into the um, soil amendments and top dressing, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of dethatching and aerating, do we need to purchase these tools, or are they available to rent? <clears throat> I would say for most lawns, you're probably just going to want to rent them. Um, a lot of places will rent them for pretty cheap, you know, 50 bucks a day, that kind of thing. Um, and usually won't need it for more than a day unless you've got a pretty expansive area. Um, and that's something you may need at most twice a year. So it's not something I'm going to go out and buy. You know, it'll sit in your shed forever. Be covered in spiders when you take it out. And I'm, you know, I'm not trying to bother with all that. Um, I think renting is usually the best way to go there. Um, so once, you know, you've dethatched if needed, if you've aerated if needed, um, after this, you can go ahead and see if your soil needs any amending. So if you've got a plan with us, you know, you should have received your soil test. That will let you know the pH of your soil. The organic matter content, all of these things. Um, for lime and sulfur, we're specifically looking at the pH of your soil. So if your soil is too acidic, which is more of the norm in the northern regions, um, you can add some lime. And what that does is bringing balance to the pH isn't just good for the health of your grass, um, but it's also really helpful to release nutrients that might be withheld in the soil. So pH can kind of control which nutrients are available to your grass. So making it more of a, a middle ground is going to be the best. Um, and this isn't something you really need to do. This is really only if you've got a very low pH, something under like a four um, or very high pH, something 8.5 or nine. Um, That's when you would be adding the sulfur if you've got a very high pH. Um, and that just you know brings it back to equilibrium, making sure that we're good to go there. Um, so if you've added that stuff, you've done everything else, now you're gonna look at top dressing. Um, and even if you have a pretty high organic matter level in your soil test, this is something I recommend doing anyway, especially if you're going to be looking at overseeding this fall. Top dressing can be combined with overseeding, um, do it right before the seed and then just a little bit after. 
Um, but basically what this is, is just adding a little bit of topsoil or compost, um, a 50-50 mix if you've got a pretty low organic matter level um, and just spreading a very thin layer over your lawn. Um, there's calculators out there to kind of figure out how much you need. Um, you just really want a very thin layer. We're talking like a quarter of an inch to half an inch. Um, and that'll be there just to uh, start to beef up the organic matter there. Um, soils without a lot of organic matter, it's gonna be harder for them to retain nutrients, retain water. Um, it's gonna be harder for microorganisms to be able to benefit your grass in that way. So I always recommend it. It can't hurt. Top dressing is pretty great in my book. Perfect. And to highlight, right, I would say the key takeaway from this slide, um, lime definitely is one of the, um, or asking when to incorporate lime is, I would say, one of the primary questions we receive when you say, but Lady Vaughn said, we can certainly discuss it. Um, and there is some concern, depending on the pH with nutrient availability, right, if we have a very acidic soil or a very alkaline soil. But typically, if the lawn is starting to yellow, or if we have a very localized factor, there's most likely something else at play that will be able to, to adjust uh, and see an improvement, right? So out of these four, top dressing tends to be the, the primary one that we, we'd we really look to, it isn't necessarily one that we need to complete a test for per se, right? Whereas the others, uh, I'd, I'd essentially consider the environment, right? And that's not just, uh, as much as Yvonne loves top dressing, that's I'm also a big fan of top dressing as well. So, <laughs> And something too I didn't touch on is leveling. So if you've got really bumpy areas in your lawn, this might've been caused from, you know, snowfall earlier in the year or, you know, your dog's running around messing up the grass a little bit. Um, leveling is a good practice. You would want to use some topsoil mixed with some sand. Um, you want to get more sharp sand, something like a builder sand. You don't really want to use like a play sand because it's very fine and will end up kind of messing with your soil chemistry. So leveling is very easy. You can do it at the same time as top dressing, just adding a little bit to those low areas. So when you seed, they'll all be at the same level. All right, and then after getting into, you know, your lawn preparation, you've taken stock of your soil, everything's good to go there. Um, now it's time to focus on some weeds. You know, now's a great time for a lot of those cooler weeds to start germinating, start taking hold, and those summer weeds are still there too, um, even though they might be declining at this point as temperatures start to cool off. Um, as far as a lot of the common weeds go, I would say the first thing I always look toward, if it's not a lot of them there, um, would be physical removal. You know, it's always going to be the easiest thing if there's just one there, just to yank it up and continue with your day. Um, but if there's a lot, you know, we'll get into a little bit of that as well. Um, another thing to keep in mind, um, if you are getting a lot of weeds, especially if they have a lot of flowers, so like that chickweed in the middle with those little white flowers or the clover also, also with those white flowers, um, is to when you mow to bag your clippings. So this will make sure that any of those weed seeds, you know, you're taking them out of the environment. Some weeds will um, be able to grow just from a stem laying on the lawn. Um, so grabbing that and taking that out of the environment as well. Um, just make sure that we're not letting them persist. So mowing often, mowing high, bagging your clippings, all of these things are gonna help kind of keep them out of there. Um, I do see Rena has a question on leveling real quick. And when we level, do we just add the sand on top of the grass and then soil? So yeah, Reno, that's a great question. Um, you would actually just mix the soil and sand together um, and you'll just lay it very lightly on the grass. So if it's something where there's a really low point and then if you put it the same level as everything else, if it covers your grass, then I would just do a little bit at a time. And yeah, it'll cover, you know, maybe an inch or two of the grass blades. Um, and then you let it kind of grow over that. And then you can add a little bit more and then kind of keep building from there. Yeah, it just goes straight on top of the grass. You'll see some people, um, if you drive around, especially in the South, you'll see lawns that look like they're just covered in sand. Um, and that's just because they're starting to level the area um, and the grass is starting to go through, grow through there. Um, but again, if you don't want to cover the grass blades completely, just do a little bit at a time if it's a very low point. All right, and then back to weeds, you know, um, along with the mowing, that's what the containing weed self propagation is about, you know, bagging your clippings. Um, another thing, you know, it's fall, it's a great time to overseed, so we want to improve that grass density. Um, that'll keep those weeds from being able to find a place to grow in your lawn in the first place. So even if you don't feel like it needs it, I would say just a safety overseed every year um, is a good way to just kind of keep up that lawn density you know, make sure there's no areas that might be a little bit weaker and start to die off and then you get some bare spots later in the year. Um, so just making sure that it's thick, it's healthy, that's gonna be one of the best ways to keep those weeds from finding a place to go. Um, and that's another thing with the mowing high as well. You wanna keep the grass higher to prevent the weeds from getting enough sun to grow. Um, and then with this, you want to fertilize appropriately. So there are some weeds that really enjoy 
lawns that aren't getting enough nutrients. And then there are some weeds that really enjoy getting all of the excess nutrients that you might be giving your grass. So it is important to kind of find the middle ground. That's what we try to do at Sunday. You know, we follow the minimum levels of sustainable nutrition. We just give your grass what it needs. Um, so if you're starting to see, you know, a ton of clover in area, that might mean that we need to, you know, top dress a little bit, give it a little bit of nutrients, or we might just need to, you know, as you're applying your pouch, add a little bit more to that area. Um, clover tends to like places with not a lot of nitrogen because it can make its own. Um, on the flip side, there are a lot of weeds that really enjoy very fertile areas, something like, you know, creeping Charlie, um, chickweed I've seen in some pretty fertile areas as well. And then, you know, if you've done all these things, you're still having issues with a lot of these weeds. Um, you can definitely spot treat them with an herbicide. Um, we have our dandelion, sorry, <clears throat> our dandelion doom, which is a selective herbicide that's for broadleaf weeds. So that will be something for chickweed, dandelions, of course, you know, clover, um, broadleaf plantain. Um, if it's a large area of those weeds and they're feeling very strong, you might need to hit them with a repeat application just to get them, you know, to go away, the kind of, you know, one, two punch to get them out of there. Um, and then we also have our non-selective herbicide weed warrior. Um, this one we don't typically recommend using on your lawn because it can damage your turf. It is non-selective. It doesn't really care what it touches, um, but you can use this on grassy weeds. And this will be something that I would use a week or two before overseeding. That way you can get rid of that, that weed there. There might be some dead grass there, but you're gonna overseed it anyway. So that's a good way to kind of take care of those. And I see Amir is asking if you should fertilize or spray the weed killer first. Um, spray the weed killer first. So if you've got weeds in your lawn, that's when I would spot treat them, um, depending on whichever one you're using. If you're using dandelion doom, I would wait a day or two to fertilize. If you're using weed warrior, I would wait a week, a week and a half to fertilize after using it, just to make sure that weed's fully dead. Um, and that way we can take care of those guys. If I had to really uh, highlight this as well, right, in terms of um, improving grass density, we'll chat a bit more about patching and repairing in a, a moment here, but especially for cool season lawns, like you said, I really, um, it, I think it's a great way of uh, thinking about it as a safety measure, right, just to maintain that thick turf density. And that is, I think, one of the questions which will come up as well, if, if somebody's moving from the south up to um, up north, being more familiar with like St. Augustine and being able to add just a little bit of topsoil and let it spread, right? Uh, with cool, most cool season grasses, we're really placing a heavy emphasis on that, that seeding each year to maintain that density, so. For uh, sure. And I see Reno's got a question about um, asking about mowing high, but then wanting to mow lower before overseeding. That is a great call, Reno. That's something I didn't actually talk about. Um, you do want to mow just a little bit lower um, when you're overseeding and top dressing a little bit. Not a lot. We don't want to stress the grass out but I would say half an inch to maybe an inch if you're comfortable, um, just mowing a little bit lower before doing that and then returning to your mowing high after everything's been applied. That's a great question. In transitioning to uh, turf grass pests, right? So what we're looking for are, uh, the weeds are going to be a bit more obvious, right? If, if there are any weeds which are still um, present within the lawn, we'll be able to identify those quite easily. Uh, sometimes we'll see uh, yellow patches or what we believe is grass starting to die off, um, especially a really good example would be annual bluegrass, right, in the springtime. Um, and we'll see this, what we believe is grass, start to green up, grows a little bit quicker in the grass, but then as the summer temps start to um, start to arrive, then we see it start to yellow. We're thinking, oh my gosh, what's, what's occurring with the grass, right? In that case, it's a different it's not desired turf. So keep that in mind as well with the weeds. If it seems like there's something which yellowed out or doesn't really look like it's a desired turf, it's possible that they're, um, it's a weed as well, right? It's not always the case that we're going to, all the weeds are going to be alive during fall time, right? Um, but if you start to see yellowing patches, which don't seem to correlate with uh, any other factors. So for example, if it seems like we have this abnormally shaped area, uh, where the grass is no longer well rooted um, and it, it seems like it, it's expanding quite quickly, right? Then that's really where I would start to take a look um, for pests. So, from a long term perspective, what we're looking to, or yes, so from a long term perspective, our focus is making sure we maintain that thick, healthy uh, turf, right? So, very similar approach to the weed control as well, right? Sunday's focus is really maintaining that thick turf density and not having to go out and apply uh, a blanket herbicide, for example, or pre-emerge and prevent those weeds from uh, taking hold. Additionally, if we're able to uh, prevent the pest from ever being an issue, 
let's not apply a preventive treatment, right? Um, so if we're able to maintain that thick turf, so making sure we're providing enough water. So enough water without providing too much. <laughs> uh, in terms of fertilizer, making sure that we're not providing um, too much fertilizer, as Ivana noted. So uh, due to Sunday's focus on MLSN guidelines, uh, it's typically a much lower nitrogen load from a per application perspective and from an overall uh, seasonal perspective, right? So we're really going to help minimize the amount of thatch buildup, which will essentially, and that's one of the primary areas where the um, turf pests tend to take hold. And then finally, mowing at the optimal height. It means, again, how many times are we going to say maintain that thick turf, right? <laughs> but making sure we're keeping that stand of grass and we're not uh, creating any sparse areas, right? So that tends to be one of the areas we'll see the first pest listed here, um, grubs. And so the June beetles tend to lay their eggs in very sparse areas of grass. So whether it's due to drought stress, um, too much or too little fertilizer, right? Uh, mowing at the improper height. So if we're able to maintain that, uh, all those practices there will be able to discourage the beetles from laying their eggs and we'll be able to minimize the, the grub pressure in that manner. There are certainly other turf grass pests. So um, from a caterpillar uh, perspective, um, webworms and armyworms, and chinch bugs, typically hear more about chinch bugs uh, further south um, than up north, but certainly possible. Uh, I personally would approach pests if you start to see these yellow patches or if you have these yellow patches, if the grass is no longer well rooted, I would start digging into the top couple of inches of soil to see if we see any signs of grubs, uh, which are shown in the image on the left hand side here. Um, if you don't see anything within the soil, then we could complete a soapy water flush test. So essentially mixing a bit of dish soap with uh, water and applying it to the most recent area um, where we've seen the, the yellowing grass, right? And finally, we could consider a, a flood test, which is slightly different from the soapy water flush, um, but primarily used to test for tinch bugs. So we'll be covering all these tests in a, an article in the follow-up email. So keep an eye out for that. <clears throat> and one more thing to note with turf pests too, um, especially with grubs, um, one thing that a lot of people don't think about is that they'll start to notice a lot of wildlife in the area. So if you start to see raccoons, if you get increase in moles, that kind of thing, um, they all feed on grubs. So if you start to see these critters running around, you might notice that, you know, you might need to want to check for pests because they might be there just having a buffet. Really good point. Perfect. And Ivana, before we dive into this, do just want to say, I realize we have about five minutes left. So <laughs> I do expect we'll be running over. Um, if you're unable to, to stay, no worries. Like we said, we'll get the recording out to you tomorrow, but we'll do our best to, to wrap this up. <laughs> All right. So now that you've done everything else, you know, you've treated any weeds or pests or anything, if you've done your lawn preparation, um, or if you didn't need to do any of that, and you're just looking to start to patch and repair, um, we just want to look at, again, the environmental conditions. So you want it to be 50 to 80 degrees in the, during the day. Um, you just want to make sure um, that it's going to persist like that for a few weeks to give that new grass some time to grow. Um, both spring and fall are great times to overseed. I will say that this spring was a not great spring for overseeding. We didn't see a lot of germination. There were a lot of issues. So we're kind of relying on this fall. Hopefully it pulls through um, to get us to where we need to be. Um, so when you're looking at these areas, if you have some patches that need to be overseeded more heavily, um, you're going to want to remove that dead grass, you know, rake it up a little bit, loosen the soil, rough it up, um, add a little bit of topsoil uh, showing here, and then just a little bit over the seed as well. Um, if it's just a general overseed, um, like we mentioned with Reno, just mowing a little bit lower, um, adding some topsoil if you like, and then you can put the seed over that. Um, and then with any seed, especially, you know, as we're getting into fall, you know, we might have some rain, but, you know, there could be an un unexpected drought like we had earlier this year. Um, just watering consistently to make sure these seeds um, establish. So making sure that area stays moist, it's not as much of a concern. I think you guys are getting into some rainy temperatures, um, but just making sure, you know, if it doesn't rain, go out there, check if the soil is a little bit dry. That's another reason I really enjoy top dressing. Just, you know, it's a good indication of how dry that area is. Um, so if it looks dry, hit it with some water. It doesn't need to be very deep. We're really just trying to establish those seeds. So a nice light watering in those areas um, to supplement, just to make sure that the germination is achieved. And as Ivana highlighted, right, this is, I'd say potentially just a little bit earlier than we'd prefer to start tackling um, tackling this. But in my mind, I typically look at, you know, this is a great time to develop a plan and target, you know, mid to late August is the earliest, I would say. 
uh, and heading into the beginning of September. So that at that point, we can really tackle this uh, or hit the ground running, if you will, right? And so if we need to aerate, if we need to top dress, um, removing the weeds. So spot training as many as we want, hand pulling or digging out as many of the remaining weeds and mowing while bagging uh, before getting some grass seed down. This is definitely going to be uh, an intensive time of year, but it's also going to set us up for success in the spring. Uh, Ivana, one question I did want to ask though. So in terms of spring versus fall seeding, what are your thoughts there? Because I realize it, it can be a controversial topic. <laughs> when would you That's say true. is the optimal time to, to seed? <laughs> Honestly, it's going to be a non-answer, but I would say both, um, especially if you're dealing with a lot of bare spots. Um, I typically lean toward spring seeding, especially early spring, because it gives you a little bit more time to kind of top off if you need um, if some areas maybe didn't germinate. Um, but I will say fall is still a fantastic time. You know, like we mentioned, this fall is hopefully going to save us from the horrible spring um, we had. So I would say both if you need a lot um, and then just picking one, whichever is more convenient for you um, per year. I do see Marie's asking if we recommend pre-emergence. Um, we don't typically recommend these um, just because there's a few different things that kind of go into them. Um, one thing is that they don't actually kill the weed seeds that are there. It kind of just creates a blanket. It'll just cover those seeds. So the moment it's still a good time for those seeds to germinate and you, you know, forget to reapply one year or you're on vacation, something like that, um, they're not going away. Way. They're just staying there waiting, lurking, you know, and then once you stop using that pre-emergent, you start to get a ton of weeds coming up. Um, and so that's typically the reason we don't recommend them is that we want to exhaust that weed seed bank. We don't really want them sitting and waiting for us to slip up. Um, and then Brett asked about the most efficient way to spread topsoil in a large area. Um, you could use a spreader. You could try it. I haven't actually. Um, for what's worked with for, for me and especially in larger areas, you know, if I'm doing agricultural work, um, I would use a wheelbarrow um, and dump it in piles around your lawn and then you can rake it in. Um, you can try a spreader, you know, let me know if it works. I haven't tried it. Um, I think that would be fantastic if it does. Uh, maybe use one that you're not super fond of just in case it clogs it. Uh, but that's usually my method. Wheelbarrow, dumping in piles, raking in around. And one, you know, I, I agree with Yvonne too. This is really going to be more personal preference. And I'll admit that I'm I'm certainly not the most patient person. <laughs> so I tend to prefer uh, spring seeding for the same reasons, right? But one of the potential benefits is during the fall, we typically have less weed pressure, right? So if we are looking to aerate, um, aerating in the spring can, it's the ideal environment for those, for any weed seeds to germinate, right? Uh, that environment for the grass seed to germinate. So if you tried to seed the spring and you felt like there was a significant amount of weed growth this fall, we should be a better time uh, to try seeding. But uh, yeah, I, I always think it's better to, to try to get some grass established in the spring and uh, then we can touch it up in the fall if needed. All right, so finally, winterizing. Um, so as we're heading into uh, the fall here, I would really view, so like I said, end of August, beginning of September is going to be the most intensive part, right? I would say if we were to view this on a chart for anyone who attended the previous webinars where we had the, the growth potential chart, right? And essentially required energy over the course of the year, say late spring and then early fall are the two peaks, right? And then the summer, and then once we get to late September or so, that's when we can really start to slow down a little bit, right? So um, you can see there are certainly exceptions throughout the country. I would say for up north, uh, Late October uh, application might be a little bit later than we prefer shown on this uh, by plan page, but we can always uh, discuss that in more detail. But yeah, I would have the mindset of uh, applying that last fertilizer pouch at that time. We want to make sure um, that we aren't heading into drastic temps. So if you're set for a freeze the following day, I would hold on to that fertilizer pouch. Ideally, we're looking for the grass or the temps to be right around 50 to 80 degrees or so. Make sure the grass is still growing. Uh, like I said, I know last year, um, we had very cool temps, I believe, and then it ended up warming back up for a significant amount of time, right? So there was a period there where I would have held off on applying the fertilizer, but then we probably could have uh, gotten um, put down a little bit later as long as the temps uh, stayed consistent. So keep that in mind with the fertilizer. Uh, and then in terms of cultural practices or essentially your practices here from a watering perspective, most areas we're really going to be able to cut back on watering for the most part in the fall, right? So as Ivana noted, hopefully fingers crossed we'll have some rain um and if not 
those cooler temps will help to lower the amount of uh, amount of water the grass is going to need. If anything, if we're watering up to three times per week during the summer, what would you save on maybe once per week, you know, in the fall is probably what I'd be looking at. Yeah, and I would only supplement it if you start to notice your grass going through any sort of drought stress, you know, folding or laying down. Other than that, I probably wouldn't water too much. And I did have a note here in terms of if you do have an irrigation system with automatic versus manual valves, we can certainly discuss in more detail if anybody has any questions, but always recommend bringing up on your specific uh, system just to make sure. Uh, but keep in mind that we do want to winterize the, the irrigation system. Uh, and it will be slightly different for an automatic versus uh, manual system. Um, and then finally, in terms of mowing here, same thought process as when we're seeding, we want to mow a little bit shorter than normal. So if we were to view this on uh, a bit of a spectrum as well, right, I would say during the spring and fall, the grass can be a little bit uh, shorter, right? During the summertime, we want it to be a little bit longer just to help uh, conserve some of that moisture. But as we're heading into the cooler months, we also wanna make sure that we're not, we don't have too much moisture sticking around, right? We can start to see some disease concerns. So generally I would say if we have a, a grass, which we're keeping closer to four inches or so during the summer, we can cut it closer to the three inches uh, before heading into the winter months, just making sure that if it's extremely long, we're only removing one third of the blade per cut and not doing a drastic drop down. And then finally, the last note in terms of mowing is leaf cycling. So with those fall leaves, again, we don't want to let those leaves sit on uh, the turf heading into the wintertime, right? Typically provides too moist of an environment. So uh, leaf cycling is a great um, option. So similar to grass cycling, where we don't, we typically don't recommend bagging or clippings as long as we're not trying to contain weeds or uh, potential disease concern. Leaf cycling, we can just mow those leaves, return the nutrients to the soil, essentially. And we'll, real quick, we did have a question from Chris asking um, when you should apply nutrient pouches, if you should do it before or after overseeding, um, and then how long you want to water multiple times a day after you overseed. Great question. So. Ideally, I would be looking at if we're just completing a general overseeding, right? I personally wouldn't be as concerned um, with the, the timing of the, the nutrient pouch, right? It's not going to damage the, the new grass seed. But if there are several bare patches or a large uh, area of grass, which we're trying to get established, I would rather wait until that grass is established and will benefit from that pouch application, if you will, right? So typically, I'd say it's going to, we'll probably start to see new grass. Uh, seven to 10 days would be on the early early end, right? And if we wait a couple more weeks, I'd expect the majority of those areas to be established. So I'd say even immediately after overseeding up to three weeks or so afterwards would be the ideal time to, to apply that pouch. And then in terms of watering, after overseeding, another great uh, point to highlight. So Biggest focus is considering, again, the environment. So if it's we have a heat wave, then we might need to water a little bit more. But typically looking at daily watering just long enough to saturate that soil surface without allowing the water to start to pool, right? We don't want to have too moist of an environment. What would you say, Ivana? Do you have a, a general duration you recommend or more so just based on the soil? Based on the soil, but also I think they're also referring to how long do you have to keep up that watering? Um, schedule. And I would say just until you've noticed about 60% of that grass is fully germinated. You know, if you tug on them just slightly, you just want to make sure everybody's rooted, ready to go. Um, I would say four or five weeks, but it's very highly dependent on how long it takes for that grass to get established. Well, I realize we are way over, so we will go ahead and get this wrapped up. <laughs> uh, thank you, everybody, for um, attending the webinar today. Just as a brief recap, in terms of resources, keep an eye out for the follow-up email uh, in the recording of the webinar. Um, on our website, there's The Shed, which is our blog. Great resources there, providing everything from uh, general overviews in terms of how to top dress, how to dethatch. Um, to a uh, bit more concentrated questions such as how to um, prepare the lawn for the fall or prepare for the spring season with the cool season grass, right? Secondly, if you do have any questions, please feel free to follow up to uh, or follow up with us at webinars at getsunday.com. Always happy to chat. And lastly, our YouTube channel. So all of the webinars live on our YouTube channel along with several other uh, conversations with 
um, Dr. Frank Rossi from uh, Cornell chatting uh, about uh, common turf questions to more specific uh, demonstrations of how to apply the products in general lawn, lawn practices. So Yvonne, I realize I stole that slide from you. So is there anything that I missed? <laughs> no, that's it. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Again, any questions, feel free to reach out, reach out to us at webinars that get Sunday and we'll be happy to chat with you. All right. Take care, everyone. It was a pleasure. Bye, y'all.